my life I love, I give to thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. May I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I give to thee, who died for me. Savior and my God. I now believe thou dost receive, for thou hast died that I might live, and now henceforth I'll trust in thee, my Savior and my God. O thou who died, O Save my soul and make me free. I'll consecrate my life to Thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for Him who died for me. How happy then my life will be. I'll live for Him. my Savior and my God. All right. Thank you, Brother West. Appreciate that good message in song. Take your Bible and turn with me to Mark chapter 6. We'll be in the Gospel of Mark uh, chapter 6. You know and I know uh, that we're to... We're called uh, to possess a spirit of optimism. Um, I think of the passage, it says, This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And so uh, uh, Monday uh, is a day that the Lord hath made. We are to rejoice and be glad in it. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, These are all days that the Lord hath made. And we are uh, to rejoice and be glad in it. I will say um, I have no trouble when it comes to the Lord's Day, when it comes to, uh, quote, Sunday. uh, Yes, this is the day the Lord hath made. And uh, we are found rejoicing and uh, and, uh, we're found being glad in it. I find it a whole lot easier to be upbeat and to be positive and to be optimistic uh, on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, I, I'm thankful for each day and the joy and, uh, that uh, He gives. And uh, uh, we need to be found constantly abiding. And uh, He's the same. Uh, yesterday, today, and forever. And so, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, we can have as much joy on Monday as we do on Sunday. But it's just something about um, the Lord's Day. Uh, For one, uh, the privilege of assembly. And it's a whole lot easier for me to be optimistic uh, when I'm around uh, a membership of optimism. And uh, I'm very thankful for uh, the membership that the Lord has privileged me to pastor uh, these 23 years. And uh, I'm thankful for those who are present this evening and those who are at home. Um, again, I say this, I was speaking with uh, the Weldons, and, and of course they know my heart. Um, uh, those at home love the Lord Jesus just as much as this pastor does. And uh, if you're listening to me, I, I say that with sincerity. I know uh, that there are many who are at home that desire to be here, but they feel that this is what they need to do. And um, uh, we do not stand uh, in judgment of anyone who uh, is uh, at home this evening, uh, unless you're just carnal and in the flesh. And if that's the case, you're probably not listening or watching uh, the service. And, uh, and so if it's just a, a contrary spirit that's keeping you from the house of God, then shame on you. And the church said... 
all right, I'm up here by myself, so you need to help this preacher out. Uh, and let's be mindful of the fact that uh, uh, for the time being, uh, uh, our attendance is, uh, is lower than we're accustomed. Uh, I'm, but I'm thankful. My, my, my family, my wife, my two daughters, they will tell you how thankful this preacher is uh, to look out and see faces, to see members and see visitors. Uh, uh, it's a whole lot easier for me to preach when uh, there's uh, uh, at least someone here, uh, uh, several someones, and uh, I'm thankful to, to have um, those who are present to preach to, and I realize I'm not just preaching to uh, those in this, uh, that are assembled here uh, within the four walls of the sanctuary. I'm also preaching to those who are viewing um, at home, and I pray the Lord would uh, work in and through the message, and uh, he administered grace to the hearers. Uh, my uh, family, uh, they know, uh, they can testify, uh, and uh, I think that you know, uh, those who have been here for a while, uh, that I'm studying and I'm preparing, uh, just as I've always studied and prepared, uh, whether uh, it's uh, for uh, a, uh, to be delivered to a a full house. I'm talking about uh, whether it's um, uh, you know uh, an Easter service or uh, a special service we might have, uh, or when uh, the attendance uh, is down. Um, uh, a purpose to to study and to pray and uh, to be broken and 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 to be uh, spilled out. And, and total consecration. And so I uh, studied uh, and prepared and preached the message I felt the Lord would have me preach this morning, uh, though I left a, <laughs> uh, a great deal unsaid. If you, <laughs> if you uh, had opportunity to look at my notes from the message this morning, you'd see that I made it about a third of the way through and found a place to put an exclamation mark and did so, or we'd, we'd still be here. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think I'll be able to get it all said this evening, the message that I feel the Lord had me preach. And, um, and so uh, I covet your prayers as we deliver the message for this hour. Uh, we stand in need of encouragement as we approach uh, the week. This is the first day of the week. Uh, and so many of the faces I'm looking in, uh, I'm looking at this evening. Uh, you'll be going to work tomorrow and there's the challenges of working in a sin-cursed world, and I want you to be well equipped. And so let's look at Mark chapter 6, and let's give um, the preaching of God's Word a good hearing this evening. And so look with me at chapter 6, and I'll begin reading verse 1. I'll read down through verse uh, 13, and uh, you follow along silently your, your Bibles. I'll read it aloud. And he went out from, now note that word, thence. And then he says, uh, uh, and, uh, and it, as we continue reading, and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Uh, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, uh, saying, For, uh, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, uh, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, uh, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand or his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching, and he called unto him the twelve, began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, uh, no bread, no money uh, in their purse, but he shod, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from uh, that place. And 
whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart uh, thence, uh, shake off the dust under your feet for testimony against them. Uh, verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Would you bow your heads as we ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we do pray that you bless now the preaching of your word. Uh, we confess to you our need of hearing um, a thus saith the Lord, our need of hearing from heaven. And uh, Lord, I'm your chosen vessel to deliver the message uh, this evening. I'm greatly humbled uh, that, uh, uh, that I would have been uh, chosen, uh, called to preach. I'm uh, greatly humbled to have pastored this church uh, for over two decades, and I'm extremely thankful uh, for the opportunity to have once again this evening uh, to stand behind this pulpit and proclaim your word. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, bless and have your will and way in each heart and each life. And uh, Lord, may we be better equipped when we leave this place to do your bidding. We pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what do we know? Not everyone who hath ears to hear does. Not everyone that hath ears to hear, hears. Unfortunately, sometimes, uh, according to our text, uh, those who don't are those who live closest to home. Now, I want you to uh, zone in. I want you to focus on what was read in your hearing. And hopefully you were paying close attention, closer attention than I was on that second hymn. You know, Brother Nick has been so gracious to provide me uh, with a, uh, an order of service and uh, in reference to uh, tonight's first congregational uh, song or hymn. It was page 477, The Solid Rock, and under it says verse 1, 3, and 4. And so uh, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, and so uh, after singing verse 1, I just went into verse 2. And so he provided for me uh, so, Brother Nick, you probably heard me, and you probably were laughing and you know trying to focus on leading the congregation with the voice over here singing the wrong. I'll be more attentive next time. Okay, you know you got to. Uh, Brother Nick's keeping us on our toes. Um, he'll take a uh, hymn uh, with four or five uh, stanzas, and uh, he'll change uh, the key on the fourth just to add some variety, or he'll have us skip the chorus and go. Uh, the, uh, to the next uh, stanza and then come back. And so we're going to have to be on our toes, congregation, with Brother Nick leading the singing. And so I appreciate, again, uh, the hymn selection today. And uh, just uh, the words of these hymns have ministered to my hearing. Uh, but hopefully as I was reading into your hearing, uh, and I know a very familiar passage that you paid close attention and you call what's getting said. What's getting said here is said uh, or given to us by inspiration. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's for our edification. It's for our betterment. It, it, it's to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes that were made. Amen? And, um, and so if you'll note here, unfortunately... Sometimes those who don't, in other words, let him that have ears to hear, let him hear. The Lord, as a preacher stands and preaches his word, he desires that um, every man, woman, boy, and girl within the sound of that preacher's voice, if he's truly a man of God, that they give that preacher a good hearing, that they would have ears to hear. God's given us the capacity to hear and that we would be found doing just that. We'd be found hearing. And uh, what I'm saying of what gets said here, uh, he leaves, his, he leaves um, uh, from, uh, from Nazareth and he journeys out and he preaches and he's well received and uh, he, uh, he's given a good hearing. Um, uh, people pay attention, they listen, and they benefit. Uh, they receive a blessing. The heavens open up and they are ministered to because they give him a good hearing. Now he's returned home. 
um, and things do not bode well. Uh, he's not re- he does not receive a warm reception. And, um, and so what I'm saying is what gets said here is unfortunately sometimes those, uh, sometimes those who don't are those who live closest to home. And that's what's emphasized here in these first six verses. He returns home, and, and you would think he would receive... Um, um, uh, a good hearing, uh, but this is not the case. Uh, he had been given a good hearing for weeks on end. Everywhere he went, he received a good hearing, but now having returned home, the good hearing uh, comes to an end. How sad. Um, if anyone should be given, uh, should have given him a good hearing. Now, now note what's being said here, and you know where I'm headed, a point I'm going to make, and what I'm going to stress here by way of introduction to our study, if anyone should have given him a good hearing, it should have been the inhabitants of Nazareth. It should have been his hometown. It should have been his family. It should have been his friends. It should have been those within the neighborhood he grew up in, um, uh, where he, in essence, still lived, but they didn't. And that's what gets pointed out here in these first six verses. Thus we find that they, this community, the inhabitants of Nazareth, missed out on what other communities had experienced. And that's pointed out, if you will, in verse number 5. Look at verse number 5. And he could there, his hometown, within his own community do no mighty work, save that he laid laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Um, And um, and, and it's with great sadness um, that we consider the possibility uh, that this still remains so. Um, uh, What do we know? Well, let me just tell you what I know. If I know anything, it's this. The Lord is doing a great work somewhere. <laughs> I just, I, I, you say, you just feel that way? No, I know that I know that I know based on the clear teachings of God's Word that um, He's doing a great work somewhere. Somewhere in the world, and I'm not thinking of just one locale. I'm thinking many places Around the world, God is doing a great work. The Lord is doing a great work. His word is not falling on deaf, on, on deaf ears somewhere. Uh, lives are being changed somewhere. Um, most of us have gained a familiarity in regards to the Lord. Uh, some of us have been members of this church a long time. I said I've been here for some 23 years. Some of you... Uh, You've been a member of this church longer uh, than uh, I have. Uh, Some are new. Uh, When we're new, we're prone to listen and listen intently. Uh, But after having circled the block uh, several times, the proverbial block, uh, we, if we're not careful, we become hard of hearing. Though we have ears to hear, uh, we fail to hear. Uh, it carries with it the idea that we fail to listen. Uh, the first time we heard the preacher preach, we thought he was the greatest preacher in the world. And I say this in, uh, in the sense that uh, now having heard him preach hundreds of times, thousands of times, um, I, I'm not being ministered to like I, I once was being ministered to. And I'm not addressing any criticism or anything that's been said. I'm just saying, in light of the context, I'm trying to just put it in perspective. Um, uh, All we have to do is, uh, all we need to do is go back and read the previous couple of chapters. I actually preached uh, from the previous chapter two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago on a Sunday morning. And um, uh, shared with you all the different things that happened he leaves Nazareth and he makes his way to this village, this town, and mighty works uh, take place. And then he goes from that village or that town to the next town or hamlet to the next village. 
and he goes from point A to point B to point C to point D. To, and everywhere he went, uh, uh, there was a manifestation of his glory, and much was accomplished. Souls were saved, lives were changed, uh, healings took uh, place. Now he returns home and he's not, he didn't receive a warm reception. Did you not get that from what's said here? Uh, what did he say? Uh, a prophet is honored everywhere except his hometown. Um, there's much that I could say uh, this evening. Now, um, having brought your attention to what just took place in the previous uh, chapter or chapters, we can read forward and we'll witness what happens when people have ears to hear, uh, when people give him a good hearing. Now, I, I'm challenging you tonight, and this is um, not uh, the title of the message. Uh, the title of the message is, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." That's the title of the message. I, of course, borrowed that from the, uh, the hymn that bears the same title. But tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. After all these years, some 40 years of full-time ministry, I can say uh, beyond any shadow of doubt, uh, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. And... Um, uh, sweeter and sweeter uh, than he was the day before. Another phrase from a different song. Um, uh, I know um, that we have exited the apostolic age. Now, we're, we're looking, if you will, at what took place before uh, the day of Pentecost, before uh, he goes to the cross, and uh, we're seeing those things uh, prophesied in the book of Joel uh, come to fruition, or at least uh, part way. Um, and uh, uh, we see uh, signs and wonders as we look back, uh, as we think about the apostolic age, um, again, uh, that which took place uh, during the age of the apostles. Um, and uh, the kingdom age as a whole. And I understand that we're living in what I will refer to as a parenthesis right now. Uh, if you know your Bible, if you know anything about prophecy, uh, we're living in, if you will, uh, the parameters of a parenthesis. Um, uh, God has hit the pause button uh, in reference to the kingdom age and the promises that were made to Israel. Now, he's going to, take it off Paul's one day after the church is raptured out. If you know your Bible, you know this is so. But let's, uh, let's uh, deal with facts. Facts are facts, amen? Uh, is God still God? <laughs> He's still God. And I want you to know if His demands uh, or expectations of uh, giving Him, uh, again, as He stood and preached, uh, or His preachers, uh, if uh, he or his preacher is given a good hearing, if the demands of giving God's man a good hearing are met, there will be evidence of it. Uh, there will individually be evidence. There will be joy within the soul of a believer, within the soul of a member, uh, within a family, uh, within a congregation, uh, I know we're not living in, uh, per se, the kingdom age. We're, uh, this is not the apostolic age. Uh, he's hit the pause button, and this is the church age in reference to the age of grace. And um, uh, there are some things that have passed away that are no longer present. Uh, they will once again appear after the church is raptured out. Um, but I'm saying that we should still give God a good hearing. And um, uh, we uh, should stand next, shoulder to shoulder with Fanny Crosby 
who penned these words, though that, those that know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And so I know some of us, we've been saved a long time and I've been in the family or in the faith for a long time. And some of us have been in the same church a long time. But we should still hunger and thirst after righteousness. And there should still be an eagerness in our soul when we enter into uh, God's house. Uh, it should not become stale or dull. Now, uh, certainly the pastor plays a role in that. And that's the reason I have to study and I have to pray. And, and uh, uh, I, have to, uh, I have to truly be a man of God. But having said that, uh, familiarity sometimes breeds contempt. May that not take place in your heart or mine. And now for the message. And, uh, and so, I, uh, not for your enjoyment, but for mine. I've come, uh, the, the actual points of the message, uh, I find somewhat entertaining. And it's my attempt at faults, I say at fault, my attempt at a little humor. And so I'm going to have a good time laughing at myself, and you can laugh along with me. Uh, but I, I, I want to give you an outline for this entire chapter. And we're going to spend a little time on, on point number one and point number two and uh, a little bit on point number three. And then when we get to point number four down through verse number eight, it's just going to be in rapid fire order. Um, I, I think by the time we get there, it, 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 things are going to line up that we're going to know. It's like playing chess. You get so far in the game, you realize who's going to win. You know who's going to win. It's just a matter of uh, finalizing the moves. And so by the time we get to through point number three and we reach point number four, uh, you'll pretty much know everything you need to know. And you'll just, what we're going to do is make those final moves quickly uh, and uh, wrap up things. But let me just say, number one, the first thing we see, and uh, this is in verse one down through verse number six. Uh, first thing we see, the revelation of a rejected revelator. Now, again, this is your pastor having a little fun with the the points, the rejection, or excuse me, the revelation of a rejected revelator. That's the first one down through verse 6. What do we find him saying? He points to the history of man. He points to time and what we have witnessed. And his take, this is altogether normal. I, I didn't really expect to get a warm reception. It's always been uh, like this. Um, uh, for familiarity often breeds contempt. What gets seen is the human and not the divine. Now get that. That's clearly set forth in the text. What those at home miss, they, they, they focus on the human and they miss the divine. What those outside, the, uh, those who lack familiarity, what they saw was the divine and they missed out on the human. <laughs> and so the longer you have membership in a church, the more tenacious you have to be in your spirit to seek out the divine, lest all you see is that which is mundane, or, or I should say, that which is human. And that it's clearly set forth in verse 1 uh, down through verse number uh, 6. Um, ha having said this, it does not have to be that way here at Cornerstone. It does not have to be. Uh, uh, we can, listen, we can, uh, we can be the exception to the rule. Did you hear me? We can be the exception uh, uh, to the rule. And I pray that we would be found being the exception to the rule. You should purpose as the head of your home that your family is going to be the exception to the rule. That church is never going to get old. That preaching is never not going to be exciting. Uh, that worship is always going to be worship. Uh, that you're going to <laughs> you're going to sing, "Oh how marvelous!" and really mean it. And I say that uh, realizing, understanding that I'm the pastor asking you to be enthusiastic about your membership and about your faith. And you say, well, yes, there's something in it for you to benefit. Yes, uh, but at the same time, it's so whether it benefits this preacher or not, I'm interested in it benefiting you and that he continues to receive the glory, the praise, and the adoration. Shame on you. 
if you lose your enthusiasm. And shame on you if you lose <laughs> what Larry Brundage used to call the spizzerinctum of your faith. I pray you'll remain excited. And so it doesn't have to be this way here. Never let it be said of this church that the voice and the touch of Jesus does nothing for us. Would you agree with that? Never let it be said that the voice and touch of Jesus does nothing for us. May he never marvel, now note, may he never marvel at our lack of hearing him. Uh, the word marvel denotes the usage of limbs and lips. Did you know that? The word marvel? Did you note the word here? Verse number 6, it says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. <laughs> wow, he went over here and they believed. And 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 now he returns home. And they said, Aren't you a carpenter? <laughs> I know your brother. And he says, it's to be expected. A prophet is honored over there and there and there and over there and there and there. But when he returns home, he's without honor. The word marvel denotes the usage of limbs and lips. I called to your attention the stoning of Stephen. I was trying to think which... Deacon, and then I remembered it was Stephen. I think I said Stephen this morning. You agreed with me, so if I was wrong, you were wrong too. But um, uh, we find Jesus at the stoning of, G uh, of Stephen. We see a glimpse of what takes place in heaven, and the Lord is standing. He exercised the use of his limbs, if you will. There's a, a, the understanding he's marveling. There's the faith. The tenacity of his faith. I'm talking about Stephen, the faithfulness of Stephen. Um, it, you, what do you do when you're at a game? I remember, Brother Rustin, when you took me to the first, my first college game. I've only been to two college games. No, I've been to a third. I went to one on Thanksgiving Day so, several years back. Uh, I forget, Navy was playing someone. I uh, got free tickets. But Brother Rustin took me to an A&M game. I got to see Larry Fitzgerald. He was playing, it was against Pittsburgh. And I think the other game was uh, Iowa State. And I don't remember anyone from Iowa State. I don't think they ever, <laughs> uh, maybe the uh, halfback made it to the NFL. But I went to, and, and man, it was my first ex ex uh, experience at a college football game. And can I tell you what happened is when something on the field pleased the fan base, they stood. And there's a segment of the fan base, they stand the entire time. <laughs> what I'm saying is, Jesus stood in heaven because what was taking place on earth caused him to stand. That's the understanding, if you will. He was standing to welcome Stephen home to heaven. Uh, the idea, again, marvel, denotes the usage of limbs and lips. So what I'm saying, when it says he marveled at their unbelief, it's almost in my mind, Jesus looks at the disciple and he points over and he says, unbelief, unbelief, unbelief. What I'm saying is, what are you getting recognized for? What am I getting recognized for? Are we getting recognized for our faith? Or are we getting recognized for our unbelief? I want you to know it's one or the other. What is he marveling in regard or, or, or about in reference to your life and mine? Is it our faith? Is it our, the consistency of our faith? Or is it our unbelief? So much could be said. May, it all, may he always sense, and I'm talking about the Lord, may he always sense an eagerness and be met with enthusiasm as his words are offered so graciously here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. May it always be so. May it always be so. May it be said of us what's said of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. They received the word 
with all readiness of mind. And then others, that they heard the word gladly. Are you hearing the word uh, of God as it's being preached from this pulpit with gladness? I pray it is so. And then number two, the commissioning of a confident commander. I'm having fun. I hope you'll join me. The commissioning of a confident commander. That's verse 7 down through verse 13. I read that into you hearing as well. Note what gets asserted. He says here, as you witness and carry out your, 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 your commission, your assignment, he's speaking to the disciples. Again, he sent them out two by two, two with two. And, and if you go back and you read, and I want to summarize this so we can move on quickly. He basically says, stay focused on what you're doing. It would be good that you and I stay focused on what we're doing, by the way. We've been commissioned. As a local church, we've been given an assignment. It would be good that we not get caught up in what's going on elsewhere or around us and stay focused on what we're called to do. Uh, he says here, he says, travel light. I, 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 I'm just phrasing it, using my own verbiage to help you understand it more than implies that their needs would get met. He says, don't, don't get caught up. I, <laughs> I, you know, some people, when they, they go on a trip, I don't want to look over here. I don't want to look over here. But, uh, you know, they overpack. I'm not looking over there, so no one should think I'm... A, anyway, they overpack. He says, travel light. I, uh, several things are said. Um, it's kind of interesting that word abide implies lodging. I, I, there's a message within uh, the parameters of that one word. It carries with it the idea uh, in sharing the gospel and giving out the kingdom message then, the message of grace now. Uh, there's time involved. Um, uh, you know, the idea of knocking on a door and accomplishing your mission in five minutes is probably uh, not going to happen. Um, uh, and I realize we're not knocking on a lot of doors right now. We're not witnessing, sharing our faith. But I'm saying uh, it takes time and energy for us to accomplish the mission that the Lord has given us. It takes, uh, you think about the salvation of your own children. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps they, they were saved when they were five or six or maybe seven or eight. All that time in Sunday school and church and for us to go and knock on the door and expect that person that we meet for the first time who has very little Bible knowledge to be converted on visit number one is kind of foreign to the Scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It carries with it the idea of hearing again and again and again and again. You probably were not saved the first time you heard the gospel. It probably didn't take. And so much could be said, but that's not really a part of the message. Uh, stay focused on what you're doing. Travel light. Uh, but then expect disrespect. It's built in. It's built into what's being said here. Expect disrespect. Hope for the best. But why? But expect the worst. I say it that way. Uh, hope for the best. While some will hear, some will not. Is that not true? While some will hear, some will not. That has always been the case. That was the case. The first sermon that ever was preached in the sense of uh, after the fall of man that's recorded was preached by the Lord in reference to Abel and Cain. Abel had ears to hear. Cain did not. It's always been the case. Some will hear. Some will not. Uh, uh, this I have to say quickly. Remember your forefathers. Something gets said here. And, and um, the idea of, uh, of, of, of if you're rejected, you've not, re not received. If you'll note here uh, in verse, what is it? Verse number uh, verse number 11, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Uh, and in reference to that, I would say that the understanding, and you go to Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm covering a lot of territory, but Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, consider this sacrifice and this sacrifice and this sacrifice. And then this statement gets made. He says, the world's not worthy of such a sacrifice. 
And so what's being said here, and this was within the Jewish community or the Jewish economy, is that that message that was being shared with the world, if it was rejected, that they were not worthy of it. What a statement. What a statement. We're made worthy when we receive it. We remain unworthy when we reject it. And that's the emphasis there. The emphasis, if you will. I want you to see in reference to ill treatment has been a way of life for God's messengers. We see that in Hebrews 11 as we get to the close there, and it talks about some sawed, on, uh, sawed, uh, sawed asunder and the different mistreatments. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so ill treatment has been a way of life for God's messenger. We also see the built-in understanding that vengeance belongeth to the Lord, to quote, I will repay. And so he's given them an assignment, and he conditions them for rejection. He conditions them and says, not everyone's going to give you a good hearing. Not everyone's going to have ears to hear. So be ready for rejection. You know, some believers uh, are not ready for rejection. Uh, I, I know we, you know, in times gone by, we'll preach and emphasize and say, you know, we need to go out, need to knock doors, and then people show up, and it's their first time to ever go out and witness and share their faith. And I'll try to put them with a, a, an optimistic witness uh, who's prepared for rejection. But it just seems like without exception, uh, when someone goes out for the first time, the first door they come to is the door that gets slammed in their face. And it's like, I want to go home. <laughs> I want to go home. Uh, no one wants to be rejected. Anybody want to be rejected tonight? You just like being rejected? You say, no, Pastor. No one likes to be rejected. And yet... Uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that Jesus himself was rejected. He was rejected there in Nazareth. He's rejected, and it's prophesied there in, in uh, Isaiah 53. The crucifixion is proof positive uh, that we are, we are aligning ourselves with the, with the message and with... Uh, with uh, Someone who is rejected, despised of men. So we need to be preconditioned for it. Thank God for those who give us a good hearing. Thank God for those who, who have ears to hear. Thank God not, not everyone um, turns us down when we invite them to church or when we extend a gospel witness. I'm thankful for the friendliness of those who receive um, the witness. Uh, but I would say this thing, this idea of uh, uh, understanding that vengeance belongeth to the Lord. To, and then I said, uh, to quote, I'll repay. Uh, note here, and this is not out of place. Again, this is given by inspiration. So to point to any passage, and so you know that doesn't fit here, would be to find fault with the Spirit who put it here. Amen? So we're not going to find fault. And Sodom and Gomorrah gets brought up. Note here in the text, Sodom and Gomorrah gets brought up. Ask the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, now, now note this. This excites me just to think because I see the consistency of the Lord. But he brings us up here. Uh, the Lord brings us up to his disciples. He, and, and the idea, ask the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah if they were still around. You'd think if they had given the prophet... Um, a good hearing that their community would have been judged? The, the answer is no. Uh, you, you know, you and I, we could go, we could leave, we could go to the Holy Land, and we could go to the Red Sea, and we could say, okay, yeah, they probably crossed right here, but the Red Sea is no longer... Uh, it's no longer parted. Of course, it was closed in the Scripture, but I'm saying it's no longer parted. I mean, you can't go to the Red Sea and say, yep, that's where they walked through. There's still dry ground right there. You just go ahead, walk right. Hey, I can just walk right through where they walked through. You can't do it. I, 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 they, if you go up to near Cincinnati, Kentucky, or Ohio, uh, Ohio, somewhere right there on the border, there's a place, and you can see a replica of the ark. Uh, I, I, I don't... I don't think there's a verse of Scripture that testifies that the ark will remain, <laughs> that it's somewhere. 
I, there was books written and things, you know, some, supposedly someone found uh, the ark and it's somewhere in Turkey and, you know, Mount Ariat and all that. I have no idea if it's still in existence. But I'm saying you can go to Kentucky or Ohio and you can see a replica of the ark. I've been there. It's, man, it's overwhelming to walk in. It would cause a giraffe to faint. You seen the commercial? Okay. But what I'm saying is this. You and I, we could board a plane and we could go to the Holy Land and we can go out and we can visit a place called the Dead Sea. The very place, Sodom and Gomorrah. This is where it was and God judged it. And so we can verify it. That's still there. It's proof positive in reference to those who do not give God's word a good hearing. Hell is being inhabited because people fail to give God a good hearing. And so we know we understand that. Now, number three, the echo, if you will, of an earnest emancipator. You say, Pastor, you're, you're reaching for it. But I'm having fun. Are you having fun? The echo of an earnest emancipator, verse 14 down through verse 29. We're not going to read. But this entire uh, section of this chapter is dedicated to John the Baptist. And, 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 and it re it, basically it goes back and revisits what took place and gives us uh, an accurate uh, record of what took place. And what we have in John, he was an earnest emancipator. And, of course, um, there were those who did not give him a good hearing. And uh, uh, they thought they were through with John. Do you remember uh, the, the request, the head of John the Baptist on a charger? It's not mentioned here in the text. Uh, uh, it's not uh, emphasized. But, uh, again, we know and he was beheaded. But then afterwards, Herod starts hearing about, and he said, this is John the Baptist raised from the dead. <laughs> I love, hey, listen, the witness of John the Baptist was still being heard. I, I, I love that text over there. And it said, he being dead yet speaketh. The blood of Abel crieth from the ground. I, I, I'm saying uh, men who live for the Lord and give their lives and dedication to the preaching of His Word and the living out of their faith, their testimony will withstand the sands of time. Some of you, you hear about Brother Gideon's and you never had the joy of meeting him. You, had, you didn't have the opportunity to know him, but you hear about him. You take a hymn on, you turn, you look at the front of him and it says, uh, 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 and it's dedicated to Wallace and Frankie Giddings. Of course, Sister Giddings is still a member here. How I miss seeing her in church. Uh, she's watching. I'm sure she's watching. But I'm saying, but Brother Giddings being dead yet speaketh his testimony. My son referenced him while he was here and he was preaching. And I'm saying to you that John the Baptist, the echo of an earnest emancipator, Verse 14 down through verse 29. Though he was dead, yet he was found speaking. God's word will not return unto him void. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm so uh, enamored with that, that truth. And it keeps me going because it, it's so easy to get uh, caught up in, re, in the results of a given Lord's Day and say, you know, well, uh, no one seems to care. And I'm saying to you, that if we'll just keep preaching the Word, keep modeling our faith, that His Word will not return in and void. The response to a faithful witness will result in the hearer saying hallelujah or will haunt the hearer throughout this life and on into the next. Now that's a, 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 a statement that bears repeating because it, it, it provides you with a summary of what we just read. The response of a faithful witness will result in the hearer saying hallelujah or will haunt the hearer throughout this life and on to the next. As we revisit chapter 5 and what took place, there's a hallelujah and there's a hallelujah and there's a hallelujah. All these different places and over here, hallelujahs ring out and now he returns to Nazareth. Are you not the carpenter? And so instead of 
being visited by the divine, they see only that which is human. Instead of enjoying that which is eternal, they only enjoy that which is temporal. And it will haunt the person who rejects the message throughout this life and on into the next. Can you imagine someone in hell today who had the gospel faithfully proclaimed to them? Do you not think they think about that? Do you not think that they do not think about if I only responded in faith, if I'd only listened to the Word of God, if I had only had ears to hear. And that's what gets emphasized here, the echoes of an earnest emancipator. Number four, the testimonies of a traveling of traveling tutors. <laughs> uh, almost what's the song? What's the song? On the first day of Christmas. Da, 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 da. Okay, anyway, anyway, I'm, I can almost, maybe I can make a song out of this. You say, Pastor, it's not doing too well for an outline. I don't know if you want to make a song out of it. But the testimonies of, uh, of traveling tutors, or you could say teachers. But verse 30, look with me at verse 30. We skip from verse, uh, what was it, verse, uh, we skip down to verse number 30. And look at verse number 30, what it says in verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Now go back to verse 13 and look at what had happened, verse 13. Uh, or, or, or verse 12, and it says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. And look at verse 13. And they cast out many devils and anointed uh, with oil many that were sick and healed them. In other words, they left Nazareth and they went everywhere uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and it was met with resolve, faith. Now, it, no doubt, some rejected the message. There's always some that reject the message, but there were some who believed, and more so outside the city limits of Nazareth than within the township of Nazareth. And that's the way it is so often. Church, the township of Cornerstone Baptist Church, we have the opportunity to hear the Word of God over and over and over again. Let's not become callous in our hearing. Let's purpose. And Dad, Mom, we, we run point. Hey, listen, um, let's pray for the pastor. Let's pray for the services. Uh, and let's enter into His gates with thanksgiving in our heart. Let's purpose to get something out of church. It make a difference if we just purpose to get something out of church. What do you suppose was shared, both the good and the bad? That's always the case. The good and the bad. Number five, I told you we're picking up speed. Are you ready? The sabbatical of the stressed out stewards. <laughs> Sister, I see you smiling back there under your mask. You and I are having fun. Thank you. Thank you for enjoying this with me. You're either laughing at me or with me, and I choose to believe you're laughing with me. Okay, uh, that is verse 31 and verse 32. Uh, look at, uh, oh man, I, I love this. I, and, I, you know, I need to model my, my pastorship after the ultimate pastor of the Lord Jesus. And I, I've tried to, during this pandemic, to, to what would Jesus do if he was pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church? I mean, would he just, hey, hey! You need to be in church. Prove your faith. I mean, what would Jesus do during this pandemic? I mean, how would He lead the church? How would He respond when He senses uh, uh, fatigue and, 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 and weariness? Note what gets said here. <laughs> I love this. It's always best to follow His example and stay in line with His Spirit. Look at verse uh, 31. Verse 31. Uh, it says... And he said unto them, Come ye yourself apart into a desert place, and note this, rest a while. For there were many comings and goings, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And so, what a blessing. Uh, Rebecca, you grew up in the, <laughs> in the ministry. Your dad's a pastor. And, and, and pastors, they need to 
Keep the carrot before the congregation. You know, dangle the carrot. Keep the, keep the people moving. Ministry, 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 ministry. But at the same time, if we love the membership like we should, we care about them physically. And though we want to have church and more church, uh, if there's ever been a day where we need more churches now, we don't need less church. But at the same time, to be sensitive to the needs of the congregation, we grow weary. We get tired. Uh, I think of those, and we don't have nursery at this time. I, 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 hopefully no one's, uh, no one's thinking, Lord, just keep this pandemic in place so I never have to serve in a nursery again. <laughs> no, I don't think that's the case. But what I'm saying is, uh, I think of the ladies of our church that have served in the nursery over the years, and, and you just take your turn. You take your turn. And when there's a, a, someone absent, you take your turn. And I, I want you to know that gets recognized by this preacher, but especially by the Lord. Uh, mid- choir practice Sunday morning, Sunday night, and used to do it on Wednesday night, and, uh, you know, all those practices so we can have a choir, the staying up late to study and preparing your Sunday school lesson, the setting aside of a, of a tithe, an offering, doing all those different things. I'm saying, uh, as their pastor, the Lord was cognizant that they had been out, they were doing those things that they were doing in that community, and now they've returned and they're tired. And he says, come apart and rest. Oh, I'm so thankful for such a a conscientious Savior. When's the last time you heard that word in reference to Jesus? He's, He's not a difficult taskmaster, is he? He's not cracking the whip, and nor should we. I think... Yeah, I look back on my parenting, and if I could go back and parent my children, I, I think I was a little too hard. I mean, I just wanted to get it right. You know, I had to get it right. I, I mean, if anyone's kids are going to behave and do right, it's the pastor's kid, and I'm going to ensure it. <laughs> that is so. And I think I was a little too hard. Now, they'll say I wasn't. They'll tell you, my hunter says, Dad, you were too easy. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, Hunter. And he, you begged for mercy back then. He said, yeah, but I, I didn't need it. You were too easy. And what I'm saying is this. Look at the compassion, how sensitive Jesus was to his followers. And as your pastor at this time, at this time during the pandemic, I, 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 I want you to feel that your pastor is in full support of you and, and uh, those at home, that we're in this together and we're, uh, we're praying and uh, in faith believing. We're trusting. Hey, we're just simply trusting Him. Amen? That's what we're doing during this time. Uh, you know, We'd have thought we'd have a new pastor by now, and if the pandemic had not interrupted the flow of things, it, there's a good chance a, a new pastor could have been standing here tonight instead of this pastor. But we're, we'll just keep moving forward until the Lord in His... How many know His timing is best? Amen. We're just going to keep waiting on Him. Uh, Then we have number six, the feeding of the famished followers. That's verse 33 uh, and uh, down through verse 44. How many sermons have you heard over the years? I know I've preached several from uh, this passage or uh, the passage closely akin. Uh, The feeding of the famished followers. Uh, How many sermons on the feeding of the 5,000? I'm not even going to spend any time. Uh, I just want you to know, little is much when God is in it. Amen? He can take that which is small and insignificant, and he, it, it will turn into much if he is in it. Number seven, the witnessing of Jesus walking on water. The witnessing of... Uh, I can even throw another W in there because he's called wonderful in Isaiah. So we'll just go with wonderful, Okay. <laughs> walking on water, verse 45 down through 52. How many of you have ever heard a sermon on, on that passage about Jesus walking on water? Sure you have. Most of us have. And, um, and so he comes to him in the night. And, and there is something to be said that he marveled at the fact that they were so enamored with what they were witnessing. <laughs> and, and that kind of takes me back to, uh, you know... Uh, are we growing? Are we maturing? Uh, if what he did yesterday 
does not ignite or turn the flame up and cause us to be more fervent in our faith and in our comings and goings today, then we've not really witnessed what He did in its, uh, in its fullness. And it's interesting that he marveled that they thought something of this, having witnessed what he had done earlier. No big thing to see Jesus walking on water. Did, did you hear me, church? No big thing to see Jesus walking on water. You say, oh man, that must have been something. Uh, having been with Jesus, having witnessed what Jesus did, that should not have been something that astounded them like, whoa, because <laughs> they had witnessed him perform miracle after miracle. No big thing. I remember he created that water. Amen. Spoke this world in existence. Number eight, the last one. Drum roll. Okay. The royal return of the ruler of ruins. It's my favorite one. It's my favorite one. That's verse 53 down to verse number 56. Or the royal return of the rehabbing rabbi. I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun. I'm telling you. I, I, you know, I used to be a youth pastor, and I had to come up with these, you know, interesting titles. It was back during Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. And... Uh, and so I preached a sermon one time to our teens. We had a class on Sunday night before the service and how God used magic to overcome the Jordan. I was talking about the Jordan River, you know, magic. This is really weak. Rebecca, you got that, right? You got it, Rebecca. Yeah, you got it because you're a Laker fan. Okay. Uh, so anyway, but I purpose to take a text, not out of context, I, I, because I'm going to give it to you in context, but I purpose in closing to take a text, a phrase, and place it in the context of the flow of the message. It's a statement that gets made, and we know what it, what it, what it means, but I want you to look at it, and I want to take it in, 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 in the flow of the context here, but I want to lift it, if you will, and, and make application to where we've been thus far in the message. But look with me as we close out the message. Again, verse 53 down through verse number 56. And, and I want you to see here in chapter 6, verse 53, it says, And when they had passed over, they came into the land of uh, uh, Genesaret. Uh, again, they're back to where they were. Uh, you know, we, if you catch fish, you go back there tomorrow. <laughs> and if you'll know what gets said here, and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him. That's the statement we're going to come back to in just a moment. And ran through the whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into the village or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. See that testimony of that woman who touched his garment just a few chapters earlier was still fresh. But I want you to look at that statement that gets made in verse 54. Straightway they knew him. Straightway. Now I know what's being said. I know what's being said is that he was just there and when he returned, they knew who he was. But I want us to look at it in the context of our relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray that every service from the singing of the first hymn straightway, we will experience Him. The word uh, know or knew carries with it the idea of, 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 uh, of a relationship, if you will. And how dynamic our relationship is depends on the reception he receives. And straightway they knew him. Now listen, uh, we're not talking about the disciples. We're talking about those from the village, the villages and the different places he had visited 
And uh, they, they recognized him right off. And they went and they gathered <laughs> people from the community that had needs. You see, the last time he was here, he met this person's need and this person's need. But when he left, there were still needs unmet. Now he's revisiting these places and they said, quick, quick. And so they go and they begin to bring those that were not touched and were not healed to him. And I'm just saying here at Cornerstone Baptist Church, I pray that every service straightway, look what it says here. I make an application. Verse number, verse number 54, straightway they knew him. I pray as you make your way into the sanctuary here at Cornerstone Baptist Church, straightway, right away, at the very moment when the piano starts playing, as you make your way, maybe out of your cars, as you make your way into the building, your heart will skip a beat and you'll be glad that you're here. You'll say, now note, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Uh, where is your enthusiasm? <laughs> has it taken a vacation or is it as vibrant today as it was when you were first saved or when you first heard the message? Head bowed and eyes closed as we give a verse of invitation. I know the hour is late. I took an extra five minutes, but it was a rather long chapter. Provided you with an exposition. We didn't spend a lot of time on each point. But the royal return of the ruler of ruins. My life was in ruins when Jesus visited me. I think of the maniac of Gadara who we read about earlier. I think of the woman with the issue of blood. I think of Jairus' daughter. Remember? He raised her from the dead. I've experienced a far greater miracle than all that. I pray that when the doors of this sanctuary open, that this preacher and this congregation, right away, that we would know him, would enter into his presence with joy, with thanksgiving. As Holly plays.